Good morning, this is Albert Rosado. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the assistant pastor for Transformation Life Church. Uh, we welcome to our service this morning. I pray that the Lord may bless, bless you uh, through this message that God has, has already given to me and that um, may the wisdom of the Lord and may His anointing and Holy Spirit may be with you uh, during this morning. It's already December, December 2020. And normally in December, we're reflecting um, the year, right? Of, of uh, what has happened, what has not has happened in our lives. Uh, but also this month in December, we also have hope for the next year. And we have plans uh, for the next year. But we have to remind ourselves that those same plans, those same hopes uh, that we had, we had them in 2019 also, right? And only God knew what 2020 was gonna bring. Um, and I pray for His protection uh, in this new year that's coming in 2021, that, uh, may, that we may be with Him and that we may align ourselves with His will uh, in this new year. And I pray that God may be glorified, amen? Let, let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this beautiful morning you have given us, Lord. Another day that we can come before you uh, and look for your face, Lord Father. Seek your face. Seek for your anointing and for your presence, Father God. Lord Father, I pray for this message that uh, you have given me, Lord. I pray that whoever listens to this message, Lord, may be blessed and may be glorified, Lord Father, through you, Lord. Lord Father, I pray for anything that um, the people that are listening on these airwaves and any needs that you can meet those needs, Lord Father, only you can. Lord Father, we give you thanks. In this we pray, amen and amen. And so we're gonna be going into the book of Luke, Luke chapter seven. Uh, and we're gonna be reading uh, from verse 36 on to the end of the chapter. Uh, and so let's, let's read that, th those verses before uh, we start the message. Amen. So it reads, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and, and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, himself if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, said, answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. And certain, a certain money lender and two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And so Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, did you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. And I love the way um, Luke 
um, brings these stories to life in the gospel. We have to remember that Luke was a physician, right? He was a doctor. Uh, and so he brings a different perspective when, um, when we read these stories uh, from the gospels. But before we get into this story, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, bring, bring to remembrance of what happened before um, uh, this story that we just read, right? In the, in the first part of the chapter, we see that Jesus heals a centurion's servant. Right. The centurion heard about what Jesus can do and, and he sent out for Jesus to come and heal his servant. And Jesus, without having having to lay a hand on the servant, he healed the centurion's servant. His faith, the centurion's, the centurion's faith healed this servant. And we can see also in the next verses, Jesus heals. Jesus raises a widow's son. So you could just imagine the widow where she is, uh, uh, she only has one son and this son has died. And you got to remember back then, whenever a, a, a widow, when their husband passes away, the husband was the, their means of protection, their means of income. And when their husband dies, um, also their income dies, their protection dies, but she has a son. So she has, she's able to have a son that will, as he gets older, that will protect her and take care of her mother for her protection. Her son dies. So you could imagine um, the sadness that this woman had. And Jesus saw this woman crying, weeping because her son had passed away. And Jesus had compassion um, towards this woman. I mean, I tell you right now, anyone that is out there listening that is crying and weeping or can't find a no way, a, a, a no way out uh, is desperately seeking for something to, to get them uh, out of a situation. Let me tell you that Jesus Christ is here at this moment and he knows your situation and he has compassion over you. And we know in this in this story that Jesus um, raised this boy, right, this young man back to life. And we can see in the next verses, right, Jesus is doing a lot in this chapter. We can see that uh, many people are starting to follow. Many people are starting to notice what he's doing and what he can do. And people are following and, and flocking with him. And John the Baptist, don't forget about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison and he's not able to see what's going on. So he sends messengers because he's hearing of things, of good things that Jesus is doing. He sends out messengers out to, to, uh, to Jesus to ask him, are you the one that is to come or shall we look for another? It was like, we want to make sure that you are the Messiah that we're seeking, that you're the Messiah that we've been searching for. Are you the one that is to come or, or shall we look for another? And Jesus, uh, with, with how he is, right, he, he said, Go and tell John the Baptist all the things that you've already seen. You've seen the blind see. You've seen the deaf hear. You've seen the leper cleansed. You've seen the dead raised. Go and tell him that I am that prophet, but I am more than a prophet. I am the son of God. So Jesus accepts the dinner invitation. You see, in verse 34, he is criticized for dining with sinners. It says, the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You see, but we can see that Jesus is willing to associate with the religious elite as well. You see, Simon was probably already trying to trick him. He saw that he was dining uh, with sinners and people that Pharisees didn't associate with. And he gave that invitation to see if he would say, yes, I'll go with you and I'll go to your house. And he accepts that invitation. You see in verse 37, it reads, and behold a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. You see this verse, it indicates that Jesus reclined at the table. You see the, the Greek word for recline is kataklino. This is a characteristically Eastern style of dining, 
with guests arranged around very low tables, reclining on their left arm and supported by cushions, leaving their right hand free to feed for themselves, right? So you just imagine that, just picture that. Jesus is reclined, you have the table, he's reclining on his left side, his feet are to his back, so he's leaning towards the table and he's able to reach and eat uh, from the table. You see, so in, in, in verse 37 tells us several things about that woman. It says, surely she was not invited. She couldn't have been invited. While she is a resident of the town, she is looked down upon as a sinner. You see, the Greek word for sinner is hamartolos, which means very far apart from God or even detestable. We're, we're not told what her sin is, but we can do a lot of uh, research and back then where the women that were called sinners were prostitutes. They were very far apart. They were detestable. She was probably mocked and made fun of. See, inwardly, she was probably broken. She was probably destroyed. Her spirit is wounded. Maybe you felt like that in one time. And maybe you feel like that right now. You've failed badly. And while time has passed, you still and feel too weak and fragile to pick yourself up and move on. So how does she get inside? You see, she wasn't invited, so how does she get in there? We don't know how she got inside Simon's house, but we can say that nothing was going to stop her. She knew that the Messiah was inside and she needed to see him at all costs. Even if she was kicked out, yelled at, or even killed. But this sinful woman has heard of Jesus, right? She had probably heard his teachings. She probably saw some of these miracles that were, that were written in, these first part of the, in the first part of this chapter. She has heard his gracious words of God's love, his forgiveness, his healing, his restoration. Jesus' love captivated her into this home. Let's read verse 38. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair of her head and kiss his feet and anointed them with the ointment. You see, Simon didn't kick her out, but allowed the event to take place. And maybe he wanted to see what Jesus would do. The woman is standing behind Jesus and early into the meal, she begins to weep. You see, how long, how long was this going on? You see, we, we don't know. Each tear makes a wet mark on the dust of his feet until his feet are wet with her tears. She kneels down and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. You see, to go about in public with her hair down was considered a shameful thing to do. Yet she is not deterred. Her hair wipes his feet after her tears have washed them. Next, she begins to kiss his feet. You see, uh, finally she pours scented oil into his feet out of an alabaster jar. You see, I am sure that once that jar of perfume is opened, almost immediately it is detected by everyone in the room. The aroma of that perfume of once she opened that jar engulfed this house. While Jesus has been the center of focus up to now, all eyes turn to the woman now kneeling at Jesus' feet, weeping, wiping, kissing his feet with her lips, and pouring perfume upon them. The very int intimacy of her attentions appear to many of the guests as shocking. Add to the woman's reputation to the community, and this is downright outrageous. At least, that is how Simon the Pharisee sees it. Let's read verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You see, Simon acknowledges Jesus as a teacher in the next verse. But he doubts that Jesus is the prophet as many claim. 
He judges both the sinful woman and Jesus and is wrong in both his judgments. It is interesting that he doesn't condemn the action of touching, but condemns Jesus' lack of discernment of who was touching him and her sinful history. He can't be much of a prophet and miss this. That's what Simon is thinking to himself. Let's read verse 40 through 43. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. You see, Jesus doesn't let Simon's silent judgment go unchallenged. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, responds Simon. So Jesus began to tell a story, a parable to make a point. In this case, he recalls the appreciation one would feel to be pardoned of the load of debt to a moneylender who has the power to throw non-payers into debtor's prison. Now, the word debt in Aramaic is hopa, which also means sin. So Jesus using this parable of this debt being paid and forgiven uh, by the moneylender, but it's also meaning the sin that Jesus will be forgiving when he dies on the cross. You see, if you've ever played the game of chess, then you've heard, of the, you've heard the phrase checkmate. Jesus just called checkmate on Simon. Instead of judging the woman as Simon has, Jesus turns the judgment rather to Simon with a series of three comparisons. Let's read verse 44 through 47. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet, my feet with ointment. Jesus compares Simon's act as a host to the sinful woman's acts of love. Number one, no water to wash feet versus wash feet with tears wiped with her hair. Number two, no kiss of welcome versus kiss feet continually. And number three, no scented oil for this guest's hair versus poured perfume on his feet. You see, Simon's actions have shown little love while the sinful woman's woman has lavish love upon Jesus. Now, building upon his brief parable, Jesus turns the object from love to forgiveness. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. That's verse 47. Verse 48 to 50, but Jesus doesn't linger on Simon's shortcoming, right? Now he turns to speak directly to the sinful woman. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I have three questions. The first question I have, were the woman's sins actually forgiven before she came to Simon's house? Or at this point where Jesus pronounces them forgiven? I think she came with perfume and wept and kissed Jesus' feet because she had already reached out to, in faith and accepted the forgiveness of God that he offered in his teaching. She came because she knew she was forgiven. She came out of gratitude. She came out of love. The guests, however, don't understand. They think that he was absolving her sins then and there, and that troubles them. 
because only God could forgive sins. That's in Luke 5, 21. But Jesus continues looking directly at the woman. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He acknowledges that her faith in his promise has brought her salvation. And he bids her the blessing that Jews offer one another in parting. Shalom. Not only that it means peace, it also means prosperity. It also means wellness and goodness and blessing. Jesus was welcomed her back into the fellowship and the salvation of God's people. The second question I have is, with what intentions did the three enter the house? What were the intentions of Simon? What were the intentions of Jesus? What were the intentions of this woman entering this home? The verses that we read, we can see what were the intentions of Simon. We can see the intentions of Jesus Christ. We can see the intentions of this woman. Simon, all he wanted to do was to prove this was not the Messiah. Jesus entered this this home because he was bringing salvation to someone. And this woman entered this home because she knew that salvation was in that home. It reminds me of a story uh, that happened to me this year. Um, I was in the backyard and I saw a mouse. And when you see one mouse, most likely there's more than one. So I went to the hardware store and I bought some glue traps. And I put the glue traps around the perimeter of the home, uh, especially near the garbage, because most likely that's where they're going to be congregating um, and, and eating and dining. First day, didn't catch anything. Second day, I caught something. It wasn't a mouse. It was a chipmunk. And I can hear the women through this camera, oh my God, because that's exactly how Jasmine reacted when I told her the story. <laughs> a cute chipmunk was caught. There was no way I was going to get him off of the, the trap. He was going to, to die. My intentions were to catch a mouse, not to catch uh, a chipmunk. I had good intentions and it ended up being uh, something that I really didn't want to catch. So it brings me back to the, to, to the third question now. You see, uh, I want to ask you today, with what intentions do you follow Christ? Do you follow out of gain or love or just because? These past weeks, we've been learning about spiritual disciplines, our life groups, right? Let's be intentional with our worship. Let's be intentional with our tithing, with our generosity, with our Bible reading. You see, these three characters from, the, from this chapter had intentions. Let's be intentional in seeking Jesus Christ. No matter who looked and mocked uh, um, this woman, she went into this home intentionally seeking Jesus Christ. Let's seek our Lord God. Let's ask God for forgiveness. If we're seeking Him in different motives or in motives that are not of God, Let's ask God for his protection and let's be intentional in this new year that's coming up. 2020 has been challenging for every single one of us, but we can have hope that in the new year that God will be with us even as much as he's been with us in 2020. Let's be intentional in seeking him. Let's be intentional in speaking to our friends and family about, about the good things that he's doing in our lives. And I guarantee you, God is going to be intentional in showing his love and blessing to you. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks once again for this beautiful morning, Lord. Thank you for this word that has been said through me, Lord Father. Lord Father, I give you um, the honor and glory, Father God. Lord Father, I pray for those that are, are listening right now, Lord. I pray for wisdom, Lord. I pray for protection, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for that in this end of year, Lord, that everyone may see your face. 
they may see your hands working in their lives, Lord Father. Any needs that your people have, that you may meet those needs, Lord. I pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. May your spirit touch every single one of these lives, wherever they are. In this we pray, amen and amen. TOC, God bless you. I love you. If I don't get a chance to see you uh, by the end of the year, Merry Christmas and have a blessed new year. God bless you.